Brian, and, and thank you for taking time out of your day to, to join with us and, and go through this webinar about connecting with consumers in the changing retail environment. Um, um, my name is John Williams. Um, I'm the co-founder and managing director of uh, Melbourne-based data-driven creative agency, One Small Step. Um, and One Small Step is, the, the, is a partner agency with media agency Supernova um, uh, Media and also data agency Ground Control. Um, what this allows us to do as an agency is actually integrate all of the parts of our business to actually deliver consumers, sorry, customers better consumer outcomes. A bit of admin before we start. Um, if you have a question, drop it into the, the Q&A box and we'll hopefully get to them um, right at the end of this session. So I, I think it, it's really interesting times, isn't it? How, you know, how can you escape the words that are going around at the moment? You know, unprecedented, challenging, difficult times, the new normal, um, you know, that does it adequately describe the environment when probably not it certainly is a challenging time however it's not without opportunities there are lots of data and insight stories being told at the moment about what's happening with consumer behavior you know some data and insights gurus are suggesting that consumers will revert back to old behaviors post-covid others are saying that things have changed forever um, however i think you know based on the data that we've actually seen um, we believe that something in the middle um, what data we have actually seen as part of the exploration for this webinar is that companies that listen to their customers, people that genuinely listen, not just this passing sort of I hear you, but genuinely listen, you know, companies that actually are data led, um, companies that importantly are agile um, and that truly understand and connect with their customers and keep a balanced view of what's actually the short term needs, because obviously they're very critical at the moment from, from a business sustainability perspective, but also the longer term needs and vision or goals for that business will navigate their way out of this challenging situation and are likely to survive and may even, as we've seen in certain examples, prosper, not only in this situation, but have actually set a solid foundation for the future as well. Um, on the panel, as you can see, there's another three people here. Uh, we have Emma um, from Supernova Media. Emma hands, heads up and leads Supernova and has, has a passion for media built over 15 years working for many of Australia's leading retailers, FMCG companies, finance and entertainment companies, as well as government. Her skill set is broad, stretching across analysis, trading, strategy and consultancy. And Emma is perfectly positioned to explore the changes in media consumption broadly and as it relates specifically to the retail landscape today. Um, also, Simon from Blue Rock Digital. Simon is the managing director at Blue Rock. Blue Rock is a really interesting digital agency. Um, it's a new breed of digital agency. Um, and as part of Blue Rock Group, they bring the business expertise to a digital offering, allowing companies to connect with their customers to maximize growth. Simon has more, much more than 13 years in experience in the consulting digital engagement and e-commerce space and has worked with many of Australia's leading retailers. I'm really looking forward to the perspective that Simon actually brings because of that relationship with that Blue Rock business. Um, last but not least, um, we have Phil Zarab here. I think Phil can be summed up and probably would describe himself and he actually does describe himself as a bit of a data nerd. Um, Phil leads um, and heads up a, a, a data insights and marketing optimization agency, Ground Control. Phil has more than 20 years experience in search insights and data and technology and was re and has recently joined us from Dentsu Group and where he was actually chief data officer. Uh, he generally has a passion, I mean genuinely has a passion for, for data um, and for insights, but importantly about media and marketing return on investment for our clients. Um, as a side note, um, you know, we, we launched ground control at the beginning of COVID-19. And one of the first things that, I, that we feel put in place was a social analysis of what was actually happening with COVID-19, which has allowed um, clients and non-clients to actually access insights around what's happening from a social perspective with COVID-19. Um, to kick things off, um, I will actually hand over to Emma, who will actually take us through what's happening from a media perspective. Um, and then on to Simon, and then actually to Phil to actually bring us home and with some Q&As at the end. So thank you. Um, I'll actually now share my screen, Emma, and um, as I'm clicking through, if you need me to click through, just give me a sign. I'm hoping we can all see that. Yeah, perfect. Thank you, John. Thanks, John, and welcome, everyone. So no doubt this pandemic is hitting all of us from both a business and a personal perspective in many different ways. And I wanted to start this discussion by setting the scene and just talking about the impact that COVID's having on the advertising market. 
So advertising spend reported a sharp decline in Australia in April, which was the first month that we really saw the impact here in Australia. Ad spend was back 35%. And as we moved into May, which you can see here, this dropped even further back to 40%. So we've taken out the 2019 May um, political and union spend here, just so we're comparing apples with apples. Um, otherwise, this falls back even further to over 44% in May. And looking at the recent Jude numbers, it was back 35% again year on year. And until there's stability in case numbers nationally, advertisers are still holding back their budgets. So all channels have been affected. However, outdoor cinema and print have, report, have reported the largest declines. So as we move into retail specifically, here's a chart on the next slide. Sorry, John. If we look at the 10 categories that reported the largest decline in spend throughout May, we can see that retail really features here. The category saw declines anywhere from 60 through to 76%, depending on the subcategory, which is well above that 40% total advertising market, um, with clothing, fashion and accessories being the most affected. What is really unique about this pandemic is the increase in media consumption as a result of COVID. So we've seen TV viewership increases of over 30%, people consuming much more news and turning to trusted news sources as opposed to social platforms to get that information. And people are generally spending much more time on social uh, with a reported time spent over 100% compared to the pre-COVID world. So this isn't really surprising given the entire country was in lockdown for a period of time and Victoria currently in even stricter lockdown conditions. Um, households are spending more money on subscription, streaming services, and as we find ourselves in a period of that COVID fatigue, consumption for the general entertainment's rapidly increased and news consumption has become more stable. Um, people are binging on, on shows old and new, so personally I've been watching a lot of Friends and Seinfeld for a bit of a laugh when things can get a bit dreary here in Melbourne. Um, and sport's another interesting one, and we're seeing Australians turn to social platforms to connect with other fans, watch old games, and even new codes both locally and internationally to get their sport fix. Um, and we've also seen the rise of video conferencing platforms like Zoom, Facebook Rooms, House Party, just to name a few. So with this in mind, we've seen there's less advertisers um, and spend in market, but media consumption is higher than we've seen in years. So this presents a really great opportunity for brands uh, that are able to maintain or even grow their presence in market. It's also a great time for new players to enter the market so they can get a higher share of voice at a cheaper cost than they previously would have been able to achieve. So the graph here on this slide, it's a research study done by Lesbian A and Peter Field. And these findings appeared in the classic report, The Long and the Short of It, which looks at key principles for brands to achieve long-term growth. So what we know from their work is that share of voice is strongly correlated to an advertiser's share of market. They look at campaigns that ran in the 2008-2009 recession period, and some brands had cut their share of voice while others had raised theirs. And a great example of this is Amazon in the 2008 recession. They managed to grow sales by 28% in 2008 by continuing to innovate with new products, notably with Kindle, um, which helped them to really grow market share. They had a lower cost option for, um, for customers um, to printed books. And on Christmas Day, more people bought eBooks than printed copies for the first time ever. Um, another example is in the fast food industry. Uh, Pizza Hut and Taco Bell took advantage of McDonald's decision to pull back their advertising and promotion budget in the 1991 recession. Uh, and as a result, Pizza Hut increased sales by 61%, Taco Bell sales grew by 40%, and McDonald's sales declined by 28%. So what does that mean? Um, although the natural inclination for advertisers to cut back on advertising during a recession, those brands that can maintain their ad budget and or change their messaging can get a real long lasting boost in sales and market share. So I wanna move on and talk specifically about brand communications and why now is a more imp important time than ever to invest in brand building comms. Uh, findings from Brandwatch research looked at long-term change to consumer behavior and it showed us that we can expect a 40% decrease in retail sales over the Christmas, Christmas period this year. So this is huge and no doubt will impact a lot of you that are watching today. Um, but the impact of this for brands is enormous and in order to achieve that share of wallet over this crucial time, it's really important that advertisers invest in brand now as this saliency is going to place them top of mind when consumers are looking uh, to spend over the holiday period. 
Uh, so the big question then is, well, how much should I be spending on brand and how much should I be spending on activation? So I'll refer back to the work done by uh, Benet and Field, which draws on 996 advertising effectiveness case studies from 700 brands across 83 sectors spanning over 30 years of the IPA effectiveness data. And the study revealed that there's an average 60-40 split in terms of advertising spend with 60% of the budget spent on brand advertising and 40% on activation strategies. So this does change when we consider the category, the maturity and size of the brands. And there are other factors that come into play as well. For example, the creative that was used, the shareability of the campaign. However, this 60-40 rule can be applied to a lot of brands in order to achieve maximum growth potential. So taking away from this section, um, just move on to the next slide. There are three key points to consider when planning activity post pandemic, which we'll go through in a bit more detail. So firstly, we need to remember that we are in a pandemic first and then a recession. So again, this is really a unique time and I'll, I'll touch on this shortly. Um, secondly, investing in brand is important, but advertisers need to make sure the messaging is right. So any brand seen or felt to be opportunistic, they really, they won't fare well. Um, advertisers need to show their values and not just say them. So channels that can do this really, really well are PR, sponsorships and branded content. Um, thirdly, there's, there's a more limited role for activation. So discretionary spending is down. Um, if you're looking to push, push a promotion or product, then targeting the right person in the right place at the right time is really more important than ever. Um, it can come across, uh, across as quite tone deaf to be constantly targeting expensive products to someone that doesn't necessarily want them and has also recently lost their job. So performance channels such as search, social and programmatic can do this really well, provided that your targeting strategies are really on point. So going a bit more into that uh, first comment I said, so we're in a pandemic first and then a recession. So on the next slide, we can see here that if we look at ad spend declines during the 2008-2009 recession, it was a much slower decline um, and not as severe. So a typical recession, the issue is usually that of just demand, whereas COVID's unique, the issue is of supply and demand. So with restrictions in place, the differing impacts across markets, advertisers need to take a nuanced approach and ensure that the relevant strategies are implemented but also maintaining that flexibility as situations can rapidly change as we've seen here in Victoria. Um, so now I'm gonna hand over to Simon to talk a bit more about brand and a look at what some companies have been doing to drive innovation and sales here. Thanks for the overview, uh, Em, that was really good. So I'm also, as uh, Em said, gonna be talking about um, you know, the importance of brand and how it's uh, really, really important that we're taking the right kind of action um, when crisis sits in particular. And just the next one. Thanks, John. Yep. So in a recent study, guys, 62% uh, of our consumers said that uh, actions brands take in a time of crisis will have a major impact on brand trust. And likewise, 43% said that levels of trust increase when a brand did not take advantage in a crisis. So NIAC, um, a great case study, guys. Um, so they, for example, came out immediately and moved to adopt a new message um, which was play inside, play for the world. And they maintained that tone of voice and messaging throughout um, the, the entire period. And they also came out really strongly on shutting their physical retail network down, whereas Adidas chose not to. So really uh, understanding our customers and refining our content strategies is really critical at these times. The next one, guys, is around how we, um, we really need to tailor our messaging and really in terms of the, the, the message itself, but, but, but also uh, the timing of that uh, message. So in May's Roy, Roy Morgan Risk Monitor Survey, uh, Aussies nominated Bunnings as their most trusted brand. So um, an amazing global retail uh, case study Bunnings are. And I'd uh, just like to highlight a few things and as it relates to um, you know, the, the typical content strategy. So um, the first rule is be empathetic guys. So when crisis hits, so Bunnings came out really strongly early on around uh, that social messaging piece. Next one is um, help others selflessly when the impact is actually known. And they produce content on how the community can, community can actually support their mental health. So really good, holistic, um, high value content. Uh, the next one is be relevant with offers when, when the dust uh, has settled. 
And they also uh, produced some great content around finding DIY projects whilst at home in lockdown. And then uh, another really important one, keep your customers updated um, throughout the, that entire period. So the, the, throughout that entire period, I provided really timely updates on their COVID measures into, and also their, uh, their changing service model as well, including their DIY advice hotline, which is a great service to the, to the customer. And then the next one, guys, is being authentic. So don't lie. You know, um, it's a great overarching uh, message for all brands. And uh, they've always showed this um, uh, or showcased the personal stories from their team members, which feeds into a very authentic approach. So the next one, guys, um, so we'll jump a few slides to the next one. Okay, so the next one, guys, is around social proof and how it's having a, a really great impact on consumer behaviour and their trust for a brand. So consumers not only have more choice out there, but also uh, they're being forced to shop around due, due to lower inventory levels. So there are, they're looking for new brands out there. Look, they're looking for new products. So in a recent survey, guys, consumers' product review engagement went up 104% month on month in March this year. And 66% said the presence of social proof increased their likelihood to purchase. So incorporating um, on-site solutions like Trustpilot, for instance, is getting even more important to brand consideration and conversion. It also shows that customers are now less skeptical um, you know, with those product review sites and they're more reliant on those uh, sites. This one's for you, Emma. Just unmute them. Yeah, Emma, you're on mute. Had to happen, didn't it? Had to happen <laughs> when it was on mute. <laughs> I don't have the kids running in behind me this time. So more limited role for activation as well. So um, really, we, I, I touched on this before, but it's, um, it's really important that we are targeting the right person at the right place at the right time, um, because from that, we can actually see efficiencies in terms of website conversions um, and also in sales. So I'll hand back over to you, Simon, just to talk about some examples here. Brilliant. Now I'm going to be talking about uh, the opportunity that we have with digital media at the moment, and it's kind of flowing on from the, the overall media sentiment that um, Emma touched on before. But we're actually presented with a really unique opportunity to cap capture more customers at the moment at a much lower cost. So globally, um, you know, small and larger retailers um, have um, majorly reduced their, their ad spends, their online ad spends, that is, by about 20% um, in the last quarter year on year. Now with this lower ad spend, most e-commerce sectors have seen a notable drop in average cost per click or CPCs, as we like to call them, except beauty and fitness, which was um, up about uh, 30%. Um, now, the other dimension on this guys is uh, we've actually had a lot more traffic as well. So we've had it about 30% extra traffic. So there's a lot more demand. So what we're saying here is, um, you know, there's he heaps more demand and we can you know, drive acquisition and um, our brands for a much lower cost than we, um, than, than we did previously. And Phil's going to talk to, uh, you know, paid search and the trends that we're seeing there in, in the next section. Okay, so in a recent um, uh, Oz Post e-commerce report that they do every year, they called out some really interesting uh, trends around uh, conversion and uh, online sales. And year on year, uh, we've actually seen 68% increase in conversion rates, which is huge, guys. And that, that resulted in about 131% uh, increase in revenue. And the numbers, um, I suppose, uh, do really mimic our own uh, e-commerce client base at the moment, We're, and particularly in the, the food, food retail, stationery, furniture, and household item spaces. And then um, in conjunction with that, in a recent Admar report, uh, Big W called out that they've seen more than double the traffic to their online site and triple the sales online as well. So we've got more people shopping um, than ever before. 
and it's up about 31% uh, to, to 5.2 million. So obviously there's a, um, you know, the obvious lockdown and, and fear factors in market that's driving a lot of this behavior, but also shoppers that wouldn't usually buy online. So your older de demographic, um, et cetera, are quickly using, uh, learning to uh, use the medium and getting used to it. Now the next one guys is a, is a really interesting um, insight in that um, we're looking at the next level down at the sub industry level where we've had really decent uplifts on the left-hand side there uh, of customers purchasing groceries, clothes and health, um, health and beauty, products online for the first time. But the key takeout for me here is um, on the right-hand side there, that the majority of those people that had purchased these things for the first time online will continue to purchase online when the outbreak is contained. So to a level, there will be a new normal here, guys. Now, it should go without saying, but um, obviously a lot of brands um, have been forced to invest in digital commerce as a channel. And that's been really evidenced by Shopify's up massive growth over the last um, you know, three to four to five months. Now, of note, Shopify is now the clear leading e-commerce solution globally with over one million our businesses using the tech. And it's also the choice of um, many of our e-commerce clients as well. So in that, um, that last quarter, uh, we saw Shopify actually drive a result that was 200 million ahead of their forecast for the quarter. And year on year, they drove nearly 100% um, growth. So we're, they've seen you know, immense growth um, through their platform um, and also on the, the amount of our stores that have uh, arisen as well. And again, this has been evidenced in our own client base as well. And we've had many clients, even non-traditional retailers, um, such as wholesalers, distributors. We even had um, on the next slide, a cafe business in Bondi called uh, Bennett Street Dairy, who sold their famous cookie dough online as a result of COVID. And it's gone absolutely bananas. And now they have a, a new business um, and a very profitable business on their hands. And likewise, with a, a more traditional retail business, um, About Space Lighting, another client of ours, they're a premium lighting retailer across uh, Melbourne and Sydney. And we migrated recently their site from Magento to Shopify. And being able to leverage uh, Shopify's um, you know, you know, best practice e-commerce agility, we've been able to um, see huge uh, uh, surges in sales and uh, website performance. So it's been, um, been a really big thing for them. Now the next one, guys, um, given the restrictions, we've uh, had um, many different ways that retailers are actually engaging with their customers. So Ozpost has seen a notable 30% year-on-year growth in alternate uh, delivery options, such as contactless delivery, uh, pickup, click and collect, uh, parcel lockers, all that kind of thing. And a client, client of ours, Browse, um, who are a retail tech uh, startup, offer a platform to manage in-store reservations and virtual appointments. And they actually saw a 20% um, a increase on Christmas in terms of the amount of appointments that um, their platform was driving across their network. And um, a client of theirs, Q Clothing, have recently implemented Browse for virtual appointments and they've seen um, a huge um, uplift in engagement and 3x the average order value compared to other channels. So I guess we're seeing, um, you know, they're different channels, but um, they're, they're higher value engagements. And they also offer, their, you know, those appointments engagements to, to a more regional and international market and, and audience. Two other examples here. So about space, I touched on them before, but they're offering virtual consults now, uh, which is working really, really well for them. And Bre uh, Broza a digital first Melbourne uh, furniture retail. Um, they've done a really good job um, offering a number of different virtual channels, but they've extended this concept of a virtual console and they're actually doing virtual um, showroom tours, uh, which is pretty incredible. And they've also invested, if we go to the next slide, in um, retail AR or web-based um, augmented reality. And there's a QR code there, guys, if you want to um, essentially scan that with your phone, and what that should bring up is a beautiful DeLonghi coffee machine. And what you can do is you can basically hover it over your phone and put it on your table and see how it operates. 
So retailers um, have more and more uh, gone to this technology, uh, particularly over this period. And what we're seeing with these retailers that um, they've had a 40% increase in sales. So it's obviously a really great uh, channel to get product into your consumers' homes without the inefficiency of um, you know, the physical product um, delivery and return process. So I'd just like to hand over to Phil now, guys. Oh, thanks, Simon. That was, that was really interesting. Um, okay, I'm going to be looking at some interesting data that we're pulling out of both search and social with some uh, partners that we're working with. Uh, so we uh, partnered with uh, Pi Data Metrics for search analytics and Brandwatch for, for social analytics. So first of all, let's have a look at, at search. Um, and search gives us a really kind of interesting look into consumer behavior and gives us a different lens as to what people are doing and why they're doing it. Um, there are six main types of search terms that we can categorize into your, your kind of two areas, forecasted trends and reactive trends. So uh, growth is just steady growth over the past few years. So that might be, you know, just brand searches for, for Nike uh, as an example. Uh, decline, this actually took a while to think of a, of a good example, but Blu-ray players. So uh, really kind of big and popular search many years ago, but has massively declined in, uh, in search uh, kind of over time. You've got your evergreen activity. So this is just, you know, like people searching for, uh, uh, for food to so maybe like a Coca-Cola brand search that's just consistently uh, there all the time. And then you have your seasonal uh, activities are repeats at the same uh, time of year. So uh, that'll be, you know, your electronics retailers around Christmas, it'd be your health insurance uh, kind of search terms coming up to that end of uh, kind of financial year. Then we've got these reactive trends. So this is responding to particular events. So it could be uh, kind of weather events is often something that, that drives it. Could be uh, economic shops. And obviously, you know, being the topic of the day, we're going to look at the, the reactive trends that have happened around uh, the pandemic. So what we have done to pull this data together is look at around 4,000 keywords that we've categorized uh, across these these broad areas, so uh, kind of fitness equipment, e-learning, food and drink, insurance, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You can see them all on the screen. And then within each of those categories, we've then broken them down into different subcategories, so we can uh, kind of look at further insights and what's what's going on. And and I think you know you'll you'll see uh, over time over the last three years, there's uh, you know generally most of these ones are on a uh, on a steady growth uh, with some kind of seasonal blips. But come uh, kind of February through kind of March and April, as we hit that start of the pandemic and the, and the lockdown period, we saw massive increases in, uh, in search volume. So the biggest one of all was fitness equipment and classes. Uh, and absolutely, there was, uh, you know, gyms and, and retailers of equipment just uh, kind of selling out of everything as, as people were rushing to figure out how they're going to do uh, kind of fitness uh, and look after themselves during that lockdown period. The other really uh, big one was uh, was e-learning. Now the 204% increase um, kind of over time. Now interesting kind of point here. We also looked at this data with our partners in the, in the UK, uh, and they only saw about a 30% increase in the in the same kind of keywords for e-learning. So clearly in Australia, that drive to you know educate and better yourselves during the period was uh, was really really big. So most of these categories were quite significant uh, kind of growth. Food and drink was quite interesting because, uh, you know, it's been a pretty big one already um, and, and it only saw a, uh, you know, a slight increase at, at 29%. Um, and then for the decline, we saw uh, kind of insurance. And if you're wondering what was behind that, it was basically uh, travel insurance keywords just fell 90% or so uh, in, a, in a matter of days as everybody's travel plans got put on hold. So with these sharp peaks, we also saw uh, sharp declines for, uh, for most of the categories. Um, but what's interesting here is that, you know, the category for most of them, those searches have, have settled to a, a much higher level than what they uh, kind of were beforehand. So if we look at electricals, and this is one which has a, a, a classic uh, kind of seasonal push in that run up to Christmas, even after that uh, kind of spike and then coming down onto the dip, it's still running at about an additional 10,000 uh, kind of searches uh, kind of per month. Uh, and then likewise kind of home and garden, uh, it, it's 
fallen down 15% and that could have made a June period, but it's still like significantly higher than any of the biggest seasonal peaks uh, that they've had at, at any time. Um, and, you know, big decreases in that fitness equipment in classes. And that kind of makes a lot of sense because, you know, you're probably only going to buy, you know, one set of gym equipment or, uh, you know, your treadmill or, uh, or, or bike for, for the house, uh, or you're signing up to a fitness class or a yoga instructor, and you're probably going to be in that for, uh, uh, for some time. So let's have a look at uh, which trends are, are here to stay. And, and literally, if I had uh, an hour, and trust me, I asked for an hour, but they wouldn't let me, uh, there's lots of different categories we could dive into. Uh, but this one I thought was really interesting. So this is looking at uh, kind of clothing and uh, sportswear and loungewear uh, in particular. And although you'd have seen the, the kind of classic peak in the decline for women's related keywords and the non-gender specific keywords, when we look at men's sportswear and men's loungewear, uh, you know, you, you, you're not seeing those same kind of trends. So this is like a really uh, kind of locked in kind of consistent growth. And, and it's probably down to a lot of men who have been reluctant to do online shopping before, uh, have given it a crack and discovered that actually it's it's pretty good and uh, please give me some uh, some more of that. One of the other great things that we have with Impide Out of Metrics is this uh, kind of SERP radar tool. So SERP is search engine uh, kind of results page, and one of the things it does is it enables us to look at the different types of search results uh, that come up for the different uh, buckets of keywords that you're tracking. Uh, and what this is illustrating is how important it is to diversify your content strategy. So many people are very focused on uh, your, your classic text uh, search results. So how do you optimize your website for your pages on your website to kind of come up? But what we're seeing is that uh, for many categories, the types of search results that are being given prominence by Google are indicating this kind of change in intent and behavior from, uh, from consumers. And so we're seeing a lot more uh, kind of video results and image results and shopping results uh, kind of coming up. So, you know, this is not only about how do you win in the search results, but the fact that these results keep coming up and these different types of uh, listings are coming up. Uh, is really down to Google changing how the search results page because they're kind of mimicking uh, or following uh, kind of user behavior. And they're always about how do you optimize that experience? And, you know, they want more people to click on it and have a, have a great experience. So if more people are demanding, if more video results are coming up, then that's a clear, clear key indicator for you that you probably need to be uh, optimizing or getting into that space uh, for your consumers as well. So just to kind of illustrate uh, that speed of change. We've looked at fitness related keywords and looked at this SERP radar at, at three different points in time. So kind of February before uh, kind of lockdown hit, uh, May pretty much at the, at the kind of peak or just at, at the end of the peak and then uh, kind of July. And we can see that uh, video and image type search results have almost doubled in volume kind of over that period. And so that's a, a, a pretty fast change from Google to quite significantly change, uh, you know, the makeup of the search results page. So it's a really kind of critical thing to, uh, to kind of keep track of and understand how does this impact what you should be doing from a content strategy point of view. So as an example of this, I've just done a search for, for exercise at home. Uh, and essentially, if you are not in the video results, then you're, you're basically invisible. So I had to like decrease the, the, uh, the zoom on my screen in order to even fit in a result that, uh, that wasn't video. So pay attention to what's going on in your, um, in your particular category and, and make sure that you're kind of looking at all these different types of uh, formats of content uh, as well. So if we look at uh, what you can take from this trend data um, and, and how do you kind of use it kind of going forward is look for these patterns in the, in the SERP landscape. Um, you also need to differentiate these pandemic peaks from longer term behavior change. So yes, we've seen some peaks, but uh, you know, there's lots of kind of locked in higher volumes of, of search activity uh, kind of going forward. And make sure that you're shaping your, uh, the type of content you've got and the format that it's in um, in order to, uh, uh, to match what people are searching for, but keep an eye on changes in, in the search results page and be prepared to roll out different formats in order to kind of meet the markets. 
And it may also be worth building uh, eventuality models to prepare for future lockdowns. And, and particularly interesting in Australia as, you know, obviously in Victoria, we're at a very different situation to what some of the other states are, but if we only just need to look at New Zealand, which has had a hundred days of uh, community, free of community transmission. And then, you know, as of a couple of hour, hours ago, they're back into lockdown. So things can change very quickly and that is gonna change these behaviors. But we've got this, historical data for the previous few months and we can see you know what were the uplift figures what were the change in search demand what were the effect on on business um, and then you can use that for for doing some kind of of your own modeling to figure out you know what you may need to do to kind of tweak your approach uh, should we be faced more uh, lockdowns across uh, different parts of the country so as i mentioned at the start, we also have a, a social analytics platform that enables us to tap into uh, consumer conversations across a uh, broad plethora of, of uh, platforms and uh, content sites. And what we've taken is those same uh, keywords that we're tracking from search in the same categorization, and then we've been using it to monitor what are the conversations that are, uh, that are going on uh, in Australia. Uh, and we've absolutely seen you know, an uplift in conversations in social, um, but certainly not as extreme as search. So what we're looking at this chart here is um, kind of January to uh, the, the beginning of August compared to uh, the, the previous period. So certainly, you know, big increases for the things that you'd expect. So like the web conferencing and, and e-learning, which were, were big on the search side. Uh, but, you know, where you've got those higher volumes of conversations, uh, like food and drink, it's a very similar kind of pattern there where there has been an uplift, but it's been from a, a pretty big base to, uh, to begin with. So what we've also done is then look at the last few months of data and then compare it to, uh, you know, the, the start of the pandemic period and just see, are we seeing similar kind of trends uh, kind of happening? And, and absolutely, yes. Over that uh, March, April, May period, uh, you've seen those big increases, but for the most part, uh, things are kind of falling back to pretty much kind of where they were beforehand, uh, with some minor exceptions, with uh, web conferencing um, still being up uh, quite significantly at, at 9%, and then you've got home and garden has, has pretty much stayed the same. So one of the things you can do with this data is, is look at the category that you're in and the types of conversations that are going on around your brand uh, and use this to understand whether you're in uh, an area that's going to have a uh, long-term bit of growth for your topic or whether it's just a kind of a pandemic related blip. So what we're looking at on this, this top chart here is for the health and household related keywords. Uh, and we've got in uh, gray, conversations, the volume of conversations around um, from January through to April. And then in the orange, we've got from May through to the, the beginning of August. And then we've tracked over the over time, the number of days, and you can kind of get that feel. So absolutely, as the pandemic kind of kicked in, um, in March, then you had this big increase of volume, and then we're basically back down to that uh, same level of conversations that, that were going on. Whereas for web conferencing, um, you've had a really big peak as it, as it picked up, but it's continuing to be at a significantly higher volume, like three, four times the level of volume kind of going on at the moment. Um, and to a lesser degree with, with e-learning, um, that level of conversation has, is significantly higher, but it is uh, gonna come off that, that peak from during the, the pandemic time. So it's really interesting insights you can get from tracking this data and looking, how does it apply to your category? But the data can also tell us a story of uh, kind of what's coming. So what we've done here is just look at uh, a couple of word clouds associated with that web conferencing topic and looking at what are some different themes gonna coming through. Um, and what you can see with this color differentiation is uh, trending versus fading topics with the kind of orange and red being uh, the trending topics and grays and yellows uh, kind of fading topics. Um, and one of the things that kind of stood out from this is this conversation around uh, kind of virtual reality. And there was actually about, I think 185, 186 uh, different conversations that have just come up in the last few months within this uh, filtered conversations around uh, kind of web conferencing uh, about virtual reality. 
uh, and there's certainly a lot of articles and content being shared and commented on by people uh, about different types of virtual reality and augmented reality. And, and certainly, you know, with the uh, real estate market and suddenly big restrictions being put in place and the whole method of going to market has to change, you can't have people come uh, to do uh, kind of on-site inspections. So you've got all these companies who are turning to, um, you know, 3D mapping of houses and, and, uh, and walkthroughs. So you just need to think about, again, for your industry, what are consumers talking about? What are they demanding? Some and so um, some great examples with uh, kind of augmented reality. If you go on to the next slide, John. Um, you know, we can certainly see that uh, kind of consumers are actively wanting to engage with, uh, with retailers in, in different ways. Um, so, you know, by looking at the data and understanding the trends, what people are saying uh, in social, how people are searching um, in, uh, in Google, you can really get a feel for, you know, these different types and ways that people want to engage with you just from that, you know, video content, image content, augmented reality. Uh, kind of virtual reality. So I think one thing we, we know for sure is that the, the market is changing very quickly, consumer behavior is changing very quickly, and it's really critical that you can wrap your hands around the data and understand what these changes are and, uh, uh, and get ahead of them as much as possible. Great. That, uh, that ends the, the formal part of, the, I suppose, the, the presentation. I'm just going to stop sharing my screen here um, to bring that up. And um, I think we've got a couple of questions there. But also, um, I've got a couple of questions for, for the, um, the, the people on the panel here. I think it's quite in, incredible um, in the rate of change and how rapid, uh, I, I suppose, that this digital transformation had actually occurred, how people that were sitting on the sidelines from a um, you know, a digital purchase or e-commerce perspective now being dragged into it. Um, Simon, um, you know, th there's some great examples that you've shown. Have you, and, uh, other than the, you know, the area with the, the cookie dough, have you seen any other of the hospitality industry being able to actually pivot into that retail environment? Uh, hospitality? Um, yeah. Uh, in terms of e-commerce and online ordering, um, all that kind of thing, Absolutely, there's been there's been a lot of that. Um, it escapes me at the moment, but what's that um, that solution that um, amalgamates all those uh, fine dining restaurants? Provador. That's Provador. It. Provador. Yeah. That's, so that's probably a, a quite a good example of a really good pivot in that context. Yeah, I've I've been quite surprised with with how many have actually been able to move quite quickly, and obviously um, with the, the volatile environment we actually find ourselves in that that constant ebbing and flowing, which, you know, I think some of these older, slower businesses have actually been forced to be quite agile in the way they've had to respond to these, these issues. Um, the, the other thing I, I find fascinating is what's actually happened in the call it the broader media market and that, that, that sudden change, that impact on the industry um, that just really happened overnight. Um, and obviously with Emma, I'd be interested in your thoughts here around Whilst that's actually occurred, there are some substantial opportunities there um, within the media space. You know, with obviously we're talking more to probably a retail sort of segment here. Um, what what are your thoughts or advice on where the opportunities actually exist at the moment from a media perspective? Yeah, I think there's, you know, publishers and networks are under a lot of pressure at the moment, um, and it there are a lot of short-term opportunities for advertisers, which can be great, but I think it can be easy as well for advertisers to fall in this trap of, are the values really good when the initial value presented by a publisher could be an arbitrary number. So I think it's really, really important to understand what's happening in the market, who your audience is, where they are, um, and even looking to historical campaigns that you've done in the past just to understand what works um, because you can spend, you can get a great deal on something and it can be, this is fantastic, but if it's not something that's actually going to deliver business results and outcomes for you, then the value is really not there. So I think it's just really important to understand that. Um, but also I think there's opportunities now more than ever for advertisers that can to really consider longer term strategic partnerships because those that you see value in certain areas um, can have really, really great conversations with publishers um, and working to support each other um, over a longer period where they can. Um, and I think the important thing to note here is if you're looking at 
that sort of longer term partnership, just making sure that that flexibility is there because like we've touched on, things can change so quickly um, and you just need to make sure that you're not locked into certain activity that can't necessarily be moved. Yeah, I think that's actually one of the key messages, isn't it? It's really to, to plan the best you can given the current environment, but be agile and, and rely on the data and the insights to actually to guide you. And we've yeah. got a question from the audience here, um, from Tim. Um, and none of us are, are retail experts. We obviously have a lot of data and insight to share, but um, any predictions on, you know, physical retailers post-COVID, you know, what will change? Of course, we've touched on that with this transition to online with augmented or virtual reality. Any other thoughts around what we could possibly see into the future from a retail perspective? Um, uh, yeah, Simon. Yeah, I think uh, I think certainly what we saw in the data, guys, is um, you know, there's a lot more activity happening via e-commerce and those online channels uh, when it comes to, to purchasing. So certainly are pivoting um, uh, and uh, weighting a bit more of your budget into digital yeah, is probably prudent uh, as an initial thing. And then I, I certainly think that, um, you know, the, the, the augmented reality piece for retail is really, really important. Um, I started in augmented reality many, many years ago, and um, it was it was a bit of a novelty, to, to be honest. It didn't really have a lot of practical um, use cases. But now that the technology is baked natively into to devices and also the web browsers, it's becoming a lot more practical. And we can we can use uh, e-commerce web, uh, websites to to serve out these experiences. So it's becoming a lot more practical. Yeah. Um, Phil, have you got anything to, to comment on it from what you've seen in some of the data? Yeah, look, the data is definitely suggesting that people are turning to uh, kind of e-commerce and doing a lot more kind of research online. And that's, you know, it's just a sheer practicality of not being able to go in store and chat to a, a salesperson. So I think, um, you know, as you know, with automotive as, as an example, uh, you know, it used to be that you'd have five, six uh, dealer visitations um, for people going to the... I think we've uh, we lost all there. Essentially, the number of dealer visits per, per purchase um, kind of went down to, you know, about one, one and, a, one and a half. And I think for many of these bigger ticket items, you know, we're going to see people doing all of that kind of research online for many times actually transacting online and then just going, you know, in store just to, just to pick it up. So, you know, there, there will be a role to play for that, that retail network, but, um, you know, maybe less of that kind of in store uh, salesmanship going on to get people across the line as they're going for self-service. Yeah. i have been interested in the thoughts from the rest of you guys as well. Um, just based on not only the data, but experiences. I think, you know, that there are still many online retailers who still haven't really solidly understood the user experience and how people actually transition through their site and actually really lubricating that that process of getting through to a sale. I, I would suggest through some of the, the positives and the negatives that have occurred over this last, whatever, six months, that there'll be a big rush on just improving the user experience. I think it's for, for many retailers, just a long way to go. Yeah. Yeah, I, I touched on it before, but from a, a digital context and a digital commerce context, um, you know, migrating uh, about space lighting from Magento to a brand new Shopify uh, website just gave us so much more agility when it came to unlocking those best practice e-commerce experiences that we could create. And that, that in itself um, had a major, major impact. And then ongoing, for, again, from a, a digital context is... Um, particularly for retail and e-commerce, we want to uh, be testing options month on month um, around how the user experience is served, um, you know, colours, layout, um, calls to action, and um, really optimising off the back of that. Uh, so we call that conversion rate optimization. Yeah, great. Hey, another couple of questions here. One from uh, from Rod in in regards to to FMCG and online grocery retailing and. It, this is a really interesting space um, and we've obviously seen a dramatic growth um, because of the lockdown. Um, so there's two questions that Rodney's actually posed. One is just meal consumption at home. Um, this blurring of, you know, grazing throughout the day and the impact on that, but also what we've seen also in the data, and this is more in the social data as well as in the search data, is we've actually seen an increase in people searching for more complex recipes 
and actually cooking, you know, for longer periods of time at home. Whilst there's that grazing aspect, there is actually more people settling in and actually doing, you know, um, cooking for a, a full meal rather than actually just meal construction. So I think that, you know, from an FMCG perspective, that'll have a, no doubt an impact on not only how they go to market um, via channel strategy, but also in product and probably getting back to some of those more wholesome, authentic sort of messages and basics in and around their offering their brand. And you can see that not only in the social data, but also in the search data. Um, and the other, the other part of Rod's question, um, I'm not sure if, um, you know, Simon or, or, or Phil or Emma, you want to actually comment on that as well, but that, that whole transition back to um, more, um, I suppose, uh, more meal, um, not construction, but actually cooking has actually occurred over this last, you know, four or five months. Yeah, look, certainly in, in the search data, when we break down that, uh, that food and drink category and we look at, you know, recipes and, and baking and even procurement of, uh, you know, the uh, cooking equipment and baking supplies and things like that, then, um, you know, absolutely, you've seen that kind of classic peak and then decline, but it, it's like nearly double what previous um, uh, kind of volumes were. So certainly that uh, it, it seems to be much more ingrained behavior where people are actively kind of searching out uh, these uh, different types of recipes and, and you know, starting off with uh, the raw ingredients rather than just, uh, you know, ready meals or uh, as you say, kind of meal construction. Yeah. So that looks like it's definitely something which is uh, here to stay. And even, you know, just anecdotally hearing about, um, you know, people moving from sourdough into now making their own butter at home. Um, you know, yeah, well, that, that, that's, that, that's the most recent one, isn't it? The, the yeah. making your own butter at home. But Emma, you know, the, the data that came through on how MasterChef performed, no doubt that's been, was probably right time, right place with, uh, you know, a high quality cooking show has probably driven some of that behaviour as well. Yeah, I think obviously people aren't able to go to restaurants um, in particular markets and there's restrictions around that. Um, people are looking for things to do at home. Um, cooking is a great uh way to actually spend time with the family and do something that you can actually enjoy at the end of it. We saw um, in terms of where people are looking for this content is really important. Phil touched on this point earlier about making sure that you're, um, you know, creating content for the right platforms and YouTube is a great example. I can't think of the number off the top of my head, but search YouTube was, you know, the number one place people were going to, to look at cooking videos, searching for baking videos. Um, so it's really making sure that you're you're understanding where where those platforms are and how can you how can you create content um, that's going to resonate with that audience on that platform as well. Um, yeah. And there's been some really interesting partnerships actually. Even um, the Thermomix is an example they were featured all over MasterChef, but even partnering with at home fitness solutions, for example, Sam Wood. So all of Sam Wood's recipe plans will now be able to be uploaded on the Thermomix um, cookie dough, which is directly on the machine and it guides people through this cooking experience. So just thinking of how you can actually get your products onto those. Um, into those areas of technology where people are actually using them to create these recipes. I think there's an opportunity there. Um, yeah. And like we've seen historically with taste, having, you know, branded recipes and things like that, it's just what's the next um, iteration of that. Yeah. Yeah. And the other uh, question from Rod was around the, the grocery environment um, in particular as more people are moving online. Um, you know, the, uh, I suppose the typical sort of um, grocery environment at the moment is just search product, click, put in your into your, your basket sort of thing. Um, has anybody seen any virtual walkthroughs for um, for grocery stores? I know that mm -hmm. uh, in the UK they were working on it probably about five years ago in, in part, but has anybody seen that come to life? Because that'll obviously bring in a different dynamic of impulse purchase and being able to browse rather than actually just search for your product. Anybody seen anything in that space? Tesco Home Plus actually um, a few years ago did a, a great campaign. It was in Asia and it, they had it set up at subway stations. It was that, yeah, you've seen that where they had yeah, products yeah. and it looks like the actual aisles that you'd see in the supermarket. People could click on the products um, and actually have it in their cart. And by the time they got the train home, it was already at their door waiting for them. Um, one of the supermarkets replicated that campaign at Flinders Street Station here a few years ago and i think it, it didn't see the success that it's saw in asia i think for a few reasons we didn't have that 
um, penetration of online grocery shopping that they were seeing there. And I think people here were less inclined um, to buy packaged foods and buy the, the fresh fruit and veg um, without actually seeing it. So it was more of that uh, difference with the, um, I guess, culturally here than we're saying over there. But it would be really interesting to see, yeah, how, you know, if there's opportunity to pick that back up here, I guess, and how could that look? Not because people won't be at train stations as much in the short term, but being able to have that experience on their um, desktop would be, yeah, be really interesting. Yeah, and I think that, you know, that's obviously a step in the right direction. Uh, some stuff I've seen about five years ago out of the out of the UK um, was more around convenience store. And it was actually quite, um, felt quite agricultural at that time in the way they were actually doing it. But uh, not only could you scan the product, but you could actually, without having goggles on, you could, with your mouse, walk through the store and actually have a look at a few things. So I think it, it, it's probably got a long way to go still, even though that's four or five years ago. Um, and that's probably the reason why we don't have it yet. But um, I suppose that's one of my frustrations. I, I miss out on buying my chocolate when I do my Coles online shopping now. because You know, you don't walk past it. Um, the, the other, one you can of the just other search for it, John. Sorry, mate? You can just search for it. Well, you, you can, you can, <laughs> but yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm a sucker for an impulse purchase. Um, the, the other question, this is probably more for Simon with, you know, with your relationship within in Blue Rock. And the question here comes, um, no, from from Diane. Um, what kind of infrastructure and HR changes in, in retail business should should be considered when transitioning from predominantly a physical to a digital sort of retail retailer? Have you got any thoughts? I'm just thinking about your relationship back into the bigger Blue Rock business. Yeah, uh, I guess typically from from an infrastructure perspective, uh, it's it's largely uh, what um, I suppose the e-commerce um, tech stack requires. So so that could be um, multiple sort of sorts of things, and, and really what it does require, I guess, um, consulting on the actual situation. Um, so keen to speak to you, Diane, after this on what your situation is, and then we could um, explore that a bit further. On the HR side of things, I don't see a huge impact there, um, unless anyone else has some thoughts on that one. Not, not really, no. It's uh, no doubt there would be in, in regards to systems and processes, in particular as we're working in a, in a home environment versus an office environment, office environment. No doubt there'll be some changes there, but uh, that, that's, uh, that's not our expertise, so yeah. I know we, um, we're just about to run out of time. Um, just a couple of other questions quite quickly. And there's some comments here, which um, we can respond to individually as well. But um, you know, the, Simon, in, in just dr drilling into that user experience, Sasha's actually asked, um, what would your tips be um, for retailers just starting out in, in transitioning to an e-commerce platform? Sure. Yeah, look, look I think, um... You know, Shopify, I mentioned it quite a few times uh, throughout the presentation, but that's um, really, really accessible. Um, it's not going to cost the world. And uh, you can actually leverage um, leverage um, an array of best practice themes as a starting point uh, to get, get you to market. And then outside of that, I'd probably suggest a, um, a cloud-based inventory system um, without knowing your, your, your situation. A really good one that we tend to use quite a lot um, is a solution called Deer Systems that integrates natively with uh, things like our Shopify, uh, HubSpot um, a solution as well, which is a CMS and um, automation tool that, that complements e-commerce um, uh, really, really well. So I'll probably start there from an infrastructure perspective. And then, um, you know, you know build, build out your, your, your customer personas and then build out content that um, is going to appeal to those customer personas and uh, get yourself a really good uh, digital agency to, to run some, some paid media advertising for you. Great. Thank you. Well, we're, we're pretty much out of, out of time. Um, that's the one hour is up. So um, thank you for everybody that actually came along. There are a couple of other questions that... Um, from Mark and from uh, which we'll respond to uh, offline. Um, but Boyd, yes, the the presentation will be available and we'll be circulating this so you can you can actually share with your staff. Um, and and Philip, in regards to um, you know AR and VR, yes, there's always room for improvement. I think everybody would acknowledge that that it's not perfect yet. Um, but I think it's it's sort of come a long way in the last five six years and 
you can see the benefit it can be as we've been through this situation being forced or encouraged to get online. I think AR will actually come along in, and VR will come along in leaps and bounds purely because of the, I suppose, the environment we're in. So, um, so thank you everybody. Um, thanks Phil, thanks Simon, um, thanks Emma, um, and thanks Rosie for actually setting all this up. Um, and yes, the, the presentation will be circulated as will be the, uh, I think the recording of this presentation as well for people to actually consume. So, but thanks again for your time, really appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye.